go ahead and get started here. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. This is the seventh annual Hot Topics in Intellectual Property Law Symposium. Um, this year, it's a joint effort put on by the Intellectual Property and Cyber Law Society here at Duke Law School and uh, the Technology Law and Review Journal. Um, there's going to be a change in the speaking order on the morning panel. Uh, Andrew Spence is going to speak third, and then the uh, speaker who is supposed to speak third can't make it, so we're going to have Cindy Rothschild take his place, and she's going to be speaking fourth. Uh, just make a note of that if you want. Um, so we're glad to have all of our speakers here. It should be a pretty interesting event. Uh, Jay Thomas is going to be giving the keynote. He's pretty well regarded, and it'll be an interesting talk. And uh, I guess Artie Rye is going to do all the introductions for, for him. So let's bring her up here then. So I am here in lieu of David Levy. I don't look much like David Levy, who is our dean. But um, unfortunately, he has called away to a, a very important meeting and um, could not be here. So he sent me in his stead. I'm a law professor here who teaches patent law and administrative law and intellectual property more generally. I wanted to welcome you to the seventh annual Hot Topics Conference. And uh, thank you for joining us. As you probably know, or you may not know, this conference is entirely student organized and student run, and it, it is a testament to the hard work and the initiative of the students in the intellectual property and cyber law society, um, as well as the, the Duke Law and Technology Journal. Um, they produce the symposium entirely by themselves each year. We, the faculty, have really nothing to do with it other than to you know, egg them on and, and um, uh, help them out with moderation of the panels. I also want to thank, um, on behalf of David Levy, um, the law firms that helped to sponsor this event, Alston and Bird, Cooley Godward Cronish, Dow Lonis, Kilpatrick Stockton, Myers Beagle, Sibley and Sajovich, and Finnegan Henderson, Fairbow, Garrett, and Dunner. As I hope you know, um, intellectual property is a particular strength of Duke Law School. We have numerous faculty who either focus their research and teaching in this field or have interests in the field. Um, my colleague David Lang, who teaches copyright in the introduction to IP course, was one of the originators of scholarly thinking about the balance between intellectual property and the public domain. Jamie Boyle, who also teaches the intro IP course, has done pioneering work on the concept of cultural environmentalism and is also a leader, a co-founder of Creative Commons, an organization of which you might have heard. Um, Professor Reichman, who's here with us today, teaches copyright and international intellectual property and is one of the world's leading scholars in those areas. And I do some empirical and theoretical work on regulatory policies governing innovation, both with my colleagues here and also with colleagues from Duke's renowned Institute for Genome Sciences and Policy. Uh, all of us try hard to translate our work into policy recommendations that really have real world impact. And I think that's another feature of Duke. Um, that uh, you know, is, is really somewhat unique. Uh, Duke Law students are a really vital component of our program in addition to this excellent annual symposium. As I've mentioned, we produce, or they produce, I should say, the Duke Law and Technology Review, and the students here work closely with faculty in contributing to the DLTR um, on various topics of, uh, of note in the intellectual property arena. Uh, as is appropriate, today's top symposium will indeed tackle some very hot topics. Both antitrust law and patent reform are extremely important for both the business and legal communities and for society more generally. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to the symposium. Um, we are going to kick off the symposium with a real bang um, by having Professor Jay Thomas of the Georgetown University Law Center deliver the keynote address. Uh, Professor Thomas is, is truly a, a star in the field of intellectual property. He is a professor at Georgetown now, but he has taught in numerous different, on numerous different faculties, um, inter alia George Washington University, Cornell, University of Tokyo, the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Um, he's also been 
uh, a congressional research scholar um, writing important reports for Congress on questions of patent reform, including the most recent patent reform legislation that is currently pending. He has written some excellent reports um, uh, carefully analyzing aspects of the various legislation, uh, the legislative proposals. Um, he has written five books on the subject of intellectual property law in addition to innumerable um, law review articles that have been of great benefit to the legal community, um, both scholarly legal community and the practitioner legal community. So I'm absolutely delighted to welcome him here today to deliver our keynote address. Well, thank you very much indeed for having me here today. It's a great pleasure to come to Duke. It's my first trip uh, to one of the world's great educational institutions. So I've, I'm just thrilled to be here, uh, and I'm especially thrilled to be uh, with my dear colleagues, Jerry Reichman and Artie Rye. Uh, Jerry's been a mentor to me and so many other junior members of the field for uh, for many years, has always been a, a charitable mentor and always someone willing to write a tenure or promotion letter. Uh, so we've, we've relied on Jerry for many years, and I, I've always appreciate your advice. And also Artie Rye. Uh, I hope uh, students at Duke are, are aware of who they have here among them. It's certainly one of our highest regarded young scholars and someone I look forward to interacting with uh, for many years uh, to come. And uh, Artie, by all means, send articles. We'll try to give them to the Georgetown Law Journal uh, in the past. If, you're, if, yeah. if you're, willing, you're willing to go down that low for your placements. And uh, we very much thank you. I also allow, allow me also to thank the sponsors. Uh, events like this where members of the Academy and the Bar can interact, I think, are just really very helpful uh, to those of us uh, in universities. And so without the sponsorship of law firms, uh, we're, we are the lesser. So thank you uh, for that opportunity. And thanks to each of you for coming today. I know your schedules are very busy, uh, and it's a great honor to have a chance to talk to you. I'm not going to do so for the whole hour. I'm not sure I could talk for an entire hour. And I know that's a great relief uh, uh, to each of you. But we'll, we'll get through some of it and, and perhaps hopefully have a bit more of a dialogue. Delivering a keynote address at events such as this is a challenge. Uh, as Artie's mentioned, I've been working at the Congressional Research Service uh, since 1999 on a part-time basis. So I've gone over, traipsed over from Capitol Hill uh, to Georgetown Law and back and forth uh, one or two days a week since 1999. And as a result, I've, no, I've had a great deal of interaction and um, a sense of what's happening on the Hill, both with the American Inventors Protection Act and also now with the Patent Reform Acts. Uh, but obviously, we're going to have a panel on that next. So I don't want to speak over much uh, about some of the specifics. What I'd like to do is place this event uh, and patent reform efforts generally inside a larger context. So let me begin. Obviously, one of our big backstories here is that the US fears a diminished technological competitiveness uh, in the 1970s. The concern is we're going to lose out to Japan and Germany, and we need to up our game. So the response is the creation of the federal circuit. Now, the primary text, we're told, is that uh, it's supposed to harmonize patent law. Patent law was supposed to be too fragmented in the United States, and so we need one that is more uniform, but the very strong subtext is, in fact, we need a more robust patent system. And so we enter what, we, looking back, we can call a steroids era of the patent system. Uh, injunctions are more easily obtained. All manner of subject matter can be patented. So the patent system goes from a very specific uh, incentive for technological development to something that's ecumenical, something that covers all of human endeavor, uh, ranging from marketing strategies to tax savings techniques uh, to artistic techniques, virtually anything the Federal Circuit says uh, is patentable. Damages go up, remedies of all sorts become more readily available, and not only do we work these reforms domestically, we project them. We take them on the road through international trade agreements, uh, both in multilateral and bilateral fora. Now, all of a sudden, and rather abruptly, we've entered a reform era. And what's remarkable are just the large number of voices uh, that are speaking now and how they're interacting to make a large number of changes at all, all about the same time. And most of you are quite familiar, the Supreme Court is back in the, the patent game has issued a number of opinions that make it more difficult to procure an injunction, both preliminary and on a permanent basis, uh, have made it more difficult to obtain patents by modifying the obviousness standard, 
and in root have probably invalidated a fair percentage of existing patents. Now, the patents don't go away, they have to be challenged, but there's a fair percentage of patents that are on the rolls right now that in one fell swoop uh, are suddenly viewed as improvidently granted. Uh, has made it easier to challenge patents. Now, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has not been idle. It also has re entered into a number of in-house proposals. I'll talk about it in a moment. And of course, we seem to be on the verge of very significant legislative reform. Probably the most significant re legislative reforms to the patent system in the United States since the 1870 Act. Now, wh while both of these uh, reform measures are uncertain, uh, again, it seems that something's going to happen and we're on the brink of it. Uh, the Federal Circuit has largely been idle during this time. It's amazing how you could have a year in review speech for patent law and not even talk about a Federal Circuit case. Uh, but uh, now we have Seagate, which has modified willful infringement. So they've gotten into the game to, uh, to some degree. Now, why the reform era now? Why, are we, why did this happen at the, this place in, in time? The standard explanations are there was a Federal Trade Commission study, there was a National Academy study, a couple economists wrote a book called Innovation and Its Discontents, uh, but I think they're, they're probably more persuasive on alternative reasons uh, why reform has come, come about now. One is just sort of a long wave theory. Law works in cycles and the US legal system has an amazing self-correcting quality. So when things get too extreme one way or the other, it begins to shift. The patent system grows too weak, the response is to augment it. The patent system becomes too robust, the, the, the targeted reforms can slim it down. So we're just sort of in, a, in, in part of this cycle, and this is sort of a downswing cycle. Another is, theory is this is really about patent eligibility. About a decade, a generation ago, patent lawyers started telling their clients, hey, you ought to be getting patents, in, particularly in software and business methods. It's acceptable, appropriate, and it needs to your advantage uh, to obtain these kinds of patents. And in fact, these users came to the patent system. They're high volume users. They get a lot of patents. Patent uh, language is not well paired to the innovations they create. So the strains upon the patent office are great. Uh, so what we end up getting are a lot of patents that come out uh, and a lot of litigation. Also what happens is firms become somewhat disquieted uh, by this prospect. Unlike pharmaceutical firms, which largely are plaintiffs and not defendants, these kinds of firms both procure patents sue, but are also sued by others. Uh, so after a while, the, the settling in uh, of the patent system uh, comes to the fore, and th these users are gonna start demanding changes to substantive patent doctrine. Not on the patent eligibility basis, but in fact for the entire gamut of uh, how to get a patent and how patents can be enforced. Another is just the general capitulation of the patent bar. Uh, when I came into the patent bar, we had patent firms. And so most people would go to a patent firm. You'd either go to a patent firm or you'd go to a general practice firm that did a little bit of patent work. Most of my students today are not going to the patent firms. Uh, the patent firms aren't, don't exist anymore uh, in large measure. Many of the most old line firms have merged with general practice firms or they've simply extinguished. So the patent bar has a sense seeded itself as a separate entity. It in fact has become merged uh, with general practice lawyers, certainly in big cities with respect to litigation. So the, 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 the patent firm and the notion that you're going to have a patent lawyer arguing before the Supreme Court is probably, at, we're, at, we're at the end of that era. We probably won't see that again. And of course, we're increasingly seeing that at the Federal Circuit. Uh, lawyers like uh, Ken Starr are summoned in to argue the biggest cases. Uh, so with that too, more generalized legal norms intrude into the system. And the other, of course, is the rise, or at least the greater recognition, of the patent troll, uh, the entity who is a patent litigant, in a sense, engaged in champertist litigation uh, by buying up patents through an auction or on the open market and asserting these causes of action against others. Because that's really what a patent is, right? It's a cause of action in tort you write for yourself uh, and enforce for yourself. So they, uh, when trolls develop and it becomes a more profitable marketing strategy, Indeed, it becomes a way to suppress speech, right? You, if you don't like patent troll tracker, good morning, Jeff. You don't like patent troll tracker, uh, you put out a bounty to identify him and sue him for infringement. So what, is, what does all this trolling do? Well, trolling in a sense, it's like the cavity that makes you go to the dentist, right? 
It's like my, I've got a pain in my mouth and I've got to go to the dentist and the dentist is going to look around and see what other work needs to be done. Uh, so in a sense, trolls in effect have acted in a sense in the public interest. They've, they've encouraged a broader look at the patent system uh, on many fronts. Now, what about the Patent Reform Act? Again, there's a panel coming later, so I'm speaking only briefly. Obviously, it's going to work significant changes to the system and other speakers that are going to talk about that. Obviously, we've got two primary areas of concern at this point. Damages calculations, there are notions that, especially for products that have many functionalities, uh, that damages are, are, are being too, uh, assessed at too great a level. Uh, that damages are accounting for the entire product and not just for the innovative portion of it. And also post-grant challenge procedures, in particular their timing, uh, so-called oppositions. Uh, when people can bring administrative revocation proceedings, when exactly can that be done? And again, I'll leave that to the other panel, but those are the two points that have uh, uh, stuck out the most. Now, enactment is uncertain. It passed the House, and it's lingering in the Senate. Obviously, uh, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to bring out predictions because I'm not very good at them about what, you know, what's going to happen in, in, in Congress. Uh, one thing I would note is if you look at that percentage there, obviously, we anticipate that Congress is going to lean more heavily Democratic in the 11, 111 Congress. So if this is something that has become partisan, uh, that, that indicator is going to, in fact, suggest greater opportunity for passage, if not this term, next term. I'll just throw that out and, and leave it. What about the U.S. Patent Office uh, trade, I mean, rules changes? Obviously, they've uh, enacted very notorious and infamous uh, changes uh, to a continuation in claiming practice. Uh, as many of you may know, some of the students may not be as familiar with it, uh, right now, the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office has no way, actually, to reject an application until 20 years have passed since the date of filing. Uh, because in the U.S. patent practice, there's nothing so provisional as the final. Uh, when an examiner issues a so-called final rejection, one can simply either engage in uh, after-final practice or file a continuation application. Uh, and there's no way, actually, for the Patent Office ever to reject an application of a, a system that is unique in the world. Uh, also, I have clamming practice, which I guess I think we're pretty far from the uh, the sea. It should be claiming practice. Um, um, it, 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 maybe I should clam up now and sit down while I'm while I'm ahead. But um, claiming, as you know, uh, there's no practical limit other than minor fees uh, for the number of claims that can be included in a particular patent instrument. Uh, one thing I like to do when I talk to my students is give up current events uh, in the world of patents. And I was showing off one of the patents that had been asserted in the notorious BlackBerry case. And I was saying, well, look, they're talking about claim 355 here and that. And the student said, well, you know, professor, this, this patent's got over 400 claims. And I'm like, well, that's nothing. The next one has 665 claims. Uh, not quite a devilish number, uh, but still a number that, that's pretty <laughs> you know, keenly felt. Now, these, all of the stuff was enjoined in Taffas v. Dudas, an opinion I think that is, is not especially defensible on administrative grounds, particularly administrative law grounds, particularly going forward. Uh, but we'll see. That litigation is pending. We'll see what happens. Um, Note that the USPTO is also engaging in two other manners of reforms that got, have gotten less publicity. One is a very ex much greater expansive information disclosure statement obligation. And my understanding is that those regulations remain before the Commerce Department at this time. And of course, the USPTO is also um, engaged in a pilot project with the Japanese Patent Office to allow multi multinational filings without the Patent Cooperation Treaty. In a sense, what the Patent Office of the world may be doing is developing a PCT-like system, but without WIPO. Um, one reason may be the cost. Another reason may be that the USPTO has become irritated with WIPO. Uh, it sees its fees as for supporting causes that are not in the interest of U.S. patent holders. And so it wants to reduce WIPO into really a, a, a shell of what it was by taking away its major source of cash. Uh, so again, we'll see what happens uh, with this pilot project. Now, what are we, now what? I mean, what's going to happen? I think right now we'll have panels that will talk, well, what's going to happen when this bill passes? If it does, will it pass at all? Will it be in a stripped down version? If the USPTO is thwarted in the Taffis case, obviously it's going to come back and put out regulations again in light of what the, that opinion holds. Indeed, if the House-based version of the legislation passed, 
much of Taffa's vedutas will become irrelevant because Congress or OVAC specifically allow uh, the USPTO to enact continuation reforms. So I think at this point, it's, it's interesting to think, well, what's the future? What, where are we going? Uh, what, what is the reform era going to look like over the next few years? And what I would hope happen uh, is that we continue trends, very welcome trends for the patent system that I think we're seeing more evidence of today than at least at any time I've been active in the field. Uh, certainly, we see much more of an innovation policy perspective uh, in patent rulings. Uh, when you read a decision like KSR from the Supreme Court, there's actually a discussion of innovation policy. Normally, you'd have to go read an antitrust opinion to get any discussion of innovation policy, right? But actually, KSR talks about, well, there needs to be a balance between the public domain and proprietary rights. Uh, when we have an innovation environment, we, they are, they're sometimes different. We need to be sensitive uh, to those variations by not enacting formalized rules. Uh, the Supreme Court has also renewed our commitment to norms of administrative law in the patent system. And my hope will also have greater norms of competition law coming in. Um, I think there's an increased recognition because of so many voices that are being heard uh, that the importance of the patent system, the United States innovation environment, simply exceeds the grasp of one court and one bar. Okay, the patent system is simply too important to the United States to be monopolized by one entity. Uh, and we, we can talk about that in, in a moment. And I think to do all of that, I think we're going to need to develop institutions. We're going to need to encourage existing institutions and develop further ones uh, that are capable of sustaining dialogue about the patent system at a high level. Now, which institutions are sort of out there and what's, what's going on with that? One thing to note is that forum shifting happens a lot uh, within the patent reform era. Something starts in one venue and moves to another. A statutory subject matter. Um, the Supreme Court grants certiorari, but ultimately dismisses as improperly granted the metabolite case or the, the lab corp case. Uh, but obviously heavily influenced by that case, uh, the Federal Circuit issues this decision in Comiskey, which is seen as very much rolling back uh, what happened in State Street Bank with regard to patent eligibility. And of course, Bilski, the in bank hearing, uh, is also at our doorstep. Uh, injunctions, uh, that was something that was on the congressional agenda initially, and it was part of the Patent Reform Acts. Uh, but with the eBay decision, it, get, it moves away from the legislature. We don't need it there anymore. Uh, continuations, initially the Patent Reform Act was redressing continuations. But Congress was happy to hand that off to the Patent Office through its own rulemaking. Uh, obviously, then the courts put, struck that down. Uh, but again, that, legislation, that litigation is still pending. And again, if the House passed version of the Patent Reform Act is ultimately enacted, uh, that will, in fact, put continuation rules back on the agenda. Even stuff that you might forget about. Come on down, gentlemen. Have a seat. Plenty of, plenty of seats up front. It's just like, just like law school classroom. No one, comes up, no one comes to the front row. But, oh well. There may be events that you don't even re recall. Remember the, patent, the Business Method Patent Improvement Act of 2000. That's probably our largely forgotten legislative initiative. Uh, but what Mr. Berman proposed at that time uh, is that uh, if you have a, a business method invention and it's, there's a prior art that discloses the business method, simply putting on a computer creates a presumption, rebuttable presumption, but a presumption of obviousness. Well, that bill never passes in the 106th Congress, but look what we get in Comiskey. Just be patient. If you're willing to wait seven years, uh, the, the Federal Circuit might say precisely the same thing. The Business Method Improvement Act was really high on the radar screen, a lot of discussion, a lot of wailing and gnashing of teeth over what this would mean. Comiskey comes by, it's relatively un unobserved. Uh, just because it seems so much else is going on in the patent system, this has become fairly muted. Now, how about appropriate for in terms of the Federal Circuit? What does the Federal Circuit think about all the different voices that we've heard? And I think it's fair to say the Federal Circuit has a, had a great discomfort uh, with other voices that have injected themselves into the patent system. Uh, let's take a look at that. How about academics? So here we are. We've got a few of us here in the front row doing this full time. Uh, I see, actually, I've got uh, Jeff Cushion, who I took a class at GW, I think, in the mid-90s as an adjunct there. And Bruce Wieders spent many years uh, as a loyal adjunct at, at Georgetown. So thank you. Thank you. And I'm sure there's others here I don't know uh, in, in the room. Uh, 
obviously, that what's been demonstrated empirically, the Federal Circuit's the least likely among any of the courts of appeals to cite scholarship. Uh, they've gone whole years citing five or fewer articles uh, in all of their opinions. Um, a letter to uh, Ms. Winters, who is the chief counsel for the House Judiciary Committee uh, for the Democratic side, um, Chief Judge Michelle says that most law professors have little or no experience in how cases are actually litigated. <laughs> uh, here's, this appears in a judicial opinion. Critical articles may be written by those who've lost a case who are not skilled or who have little practical experience. Oops. We decide cases as they come to us based on the arguments, not based on occasional journal articles. This is a discussion that Judge Lurie had, or some statements he made in a, a, dis, a, a bar association meeting. Uh, I saw the title of a meeting presentation asking the question whether it's a gap between academia and the Federal Circuit. Uh, Bruce might remember that because that was an in of court meeting we held uh, at the Federal Circuit Courthouse a few weeks before this meeting. Uh, with all due respect uh, to the importance of teaching patent law in law schools, I find the idea of a gap between the court and academia to be a bit besides the point. Again, we decide cases based on the law, uh, the statutes and precedent, and the Constitution. We're not a debating society. Debate is for others. Again, we decide cases on what the law is. Writings are not the law. Um, continuing this theme, what does the Federal Circuit think about the Federal Trade Commission? Okay, well, the FTC obviously wrote a major report on promoting innovation. And what was the comments of the Federal Circuit about it? Well, they didn't think very highly, certainly, of some of its particular uh, uh, proposals. Uh, for example, in the famous Dystar case, and this is a, the famous decision that the Federal Circuit issued after the Supreme Court had granted certiorari in KSR, the big obviousness case, but before the, Federal Circuit, the Supreme Court actually decided that opinion. And uh, here they say the Federal Trade Commission has mischaracterized its teaching suggestion motivation test uh, and ha has, has been inappropriate uh, in saying that the Federal Circuit case law ought to be modified. Now, there was another proposal. Courts should consider whether granting patents on certain subject matter will promote progress or instead hinder competition that can promote innovation. Here's what Judge Dyke had to say about that. I'm not sure what they were talking about. We can't do a regression analysis in judicial opinions. Uh, we can't play the role of Congress. They sound naive. Okay, well, what about Congress? We've kind of made our way to Congress at this point. It's not academics or the FTC. What about Congress? Well, Chief Judge Michel recently gave a speech to the Association of Corporate Counsel in which he spoke about uh, congressional efforts uh, to amend the patent laws. First, he says, well, Congress is, is kind of a part-time player. It only comes to the patent law once in a while. It's going to be another half century before they get back to it. Uh, legislation is an extremely blunt instrument. It's not a scalpel. It's a hammer. They can't master the important details of any one bill. Uh, there's a lot of mythology, it looks to me, going on in all of this. And the Senate report demonstrates a lack of sophistication uh, and naivete several times. So uh, how about the National Academies? Again, Dystar makes a similar sort of remark, saying that the National Academies has also mischaracterized uh, the governing case law uh, at the Federal Circuit. And of course, we're familiar with Federal Circuit USPTO relationships. As uh, Professor Rye is one of the leading commentators talking about the lack of observance of administrative law principles, which would have greater deference uh, to the Patent Office. Uh, to me, the trend where one court is the only dis capable decider or believes itself to be is an unwelcome one. Uh, fields of law, intellectual movement societies seldom prosper in isolation. And if Congress is, I think if the court's happy to say, look, this is up to Congress, but Congress can't really do a very good job of deciding patent law matters. I think it's a court, or just generally perhaps a bar, uh, that believes that these matters, important decisions uh, about patentability standards can be resolved really just by looking at the law, uh, whatever the law is. And we, uh, we don't really recognize that what we're actually doing is creating important innovation policy for a large number of industries. Uh, consider, for example, patent, recent patent eligibility concerns. Many of you have probably read the case in Newton, which at the, I tend to the oral argument, everyone said Newton. Um, it's about the patentability of a signal. The majority in the dissent 
if you've read that opinion, largely just debate dictionary definitions. They just each side up, each saddle up dictionary definitions, dictionaries written a long time ago, and say this is what a composition of matter is, this is what a manufacturer is, and so I'm right. Okay, there's no discussion uh, when we talk about patent eligibility concerns about the effect of imposing a patent system upon different industries or disciplines. There's no discussion of the pace of innovation in that industry and whether there's a need for the patent incentive. Uh, there's no discussion whether innovations in that industry are that capable of being addressed by the patent system, whether the patent claiming system would work well. There's no discussion of standards in that industry and whether the patent system would, would interact successfully uh, with a notion of standards. Uh, there's no sense of whether professionals want pat patents within that industry. There's no sense of how patents might interfere with the ability of Congress to legislate uh, in a particular area, for example, in tax strategies. There's just no discussion. Uh, there's a sense that we can just decide the law in a very positive sense without much innovation policy dialogue. So it seems to me all of these other voices ought not to be readily dismissed or set aside or said that they're unsophisticated or naive. I think they should be welcomed, and I think there ought to be more interaction among all these actors. Uh, we'll see uh, if that is something that's going to happen in days yet to come. I offer a modest agenda uh, to what I think might happen uh, in the future and what I hope would happen. Um, let's go through sort of each of these steps uh, to see what the free form era might look like in the future. Well, what about legislative involvement? One thing Judge Michelle says is he's concerned Congress will legislate once and everyone will leave. In a sense, that's what happened with the American Inventors Protection Act. That was a bill that did a few things. It introduced um, pre-grant publication, it inter partes re-exam, it did a few other smaller changes to the patent system. Uh, but that's one, and again, I was working part-time on the Hill at the time. Um, there were a lot of captains of industry came in, but everyone seemed to be on the same page. There wasn't a big dispute between industries. But most big industries sort of wanted the same fairly modest changes to the patent system. But when that statute was, was enacted, everybody uh, walked away. And again, I'm talking about the American Inventors Protection Act. Everyone kind of walked away. Uh, there wasn't much change. The Federal Courts Improvement Act of 1982, of course, that's the statute that created the Federal Circuit. And it's interesting because, of course, this is an, an era where the patent system is supposed to solve our technological competitiveness problems. But what Congress really did is delegate that sense or that authority to a court. I mean, there's been a lot of writing about how the Federal Circuit is an exercise in judicial concentration and specialization. But what the Federal Courts Improvement Act also is is an extraordinary congressional delegation of patent law decision-making authority. And what it really did is make Congress a lot less interested in the patent system. It's simply not true that Congress enacts legislation in one area and walks away for a long period of time. They are continuously active. Uh, and so, the, but with, I think with this statute, it discouraged uh, involvement. Uh, so I think that's something we ought to be wary of as we think about. Uh, this patent, this Congress is probably the most knowledgeable about the patent system that we've had in the history of the Republic. Now, there's a great deal of knowledge among various staff members, but it's balkanized. Okay, it's, been, it's distributed widely uh, among the staff, and it's a very transient staff. Okay, most uh, the con congressional staff are not well paid. They're often fairly young. They stay around for three or four years, and then they go off to do something else. Again, I've been working on the Hill part-time since 1999. I feel like an old-timer now. And I have to think back, well, I remember training your predecessor three times removed um, in, in various patent law matters. So I think one thing to think about is how can we deal with this? Sadly, we don't have an analogy on the Hill to the Finance Committee or the Joint Tax Committees. These are committees that have a staff of inc incredible credentials. Uh, partners of law firms easily take these opportunities. They leave their jobs to go serve on the Hill in these capacities. Uh, I think it's a lot because of the authority and the, the sway that these committees hold, uh, but also just a tradition of professionalism that has arose in these institutions. We don't have anything like that in the patent system. I think we ought to think about doing a better job with it. So what do I suggest? Well, first of all, we've got these grandly named coalitions, right? 21st century patent reform, patent fairness. Um, I hope they don't go away either when this bill was never enacted or something of the bill was enacted or the whole bill was enacted. I hope they stick around. 
I don't always agree with the platforms of, of any one of these uh, co grandly known coalitions, uh, but I think the dialogue has been good for the patent system. I, I think that they've been able to discuss matters at a higher level than we've seen, and they've maintained and encouraged a dialogue that's helped the patent system. Um, I think we also need to think about institutional competence. Um, we need to think about cycling between private and public institutions. Other fields like tax seem to be doing a better job of that. We need to encourage the fact that someone who's worked on the Hill in the patent agenda is a valued member of a law firm staff. Uh, I think we'll probably start seeing that more as law firms become lobbying entities more and more in the patent arena. I mean, we see major law firm partners coming to the Hill in a lobbying capacity. They're bringing their briefcases, they're bringing an associate. They're not going to argue a case at the Federal Circuit. Uh, they're going to the Hart Building to talk to a senator. Uh, so when we start seeing more of that, I think we'll start seeing that people who worked on the on Senate or, or House staff are going to be welcomed back at those firms in the future. I think that's for the good. Um, I think we also need to support institutions that Congress relies upon in its decision making, in particular the Congressional Budget Office and the Congressional Research Service. Uh, those offer somewhat better paid jobs. They offer jobs of more continuity because your boss, uh, uh, if it, he doesn't get reelected, you're out. Um, so I think, I think those are also institutions that are helpful. And I think we need to do a better job, if we're concerned about the patent system, of tying its issues to those of more direct congressional interest. Congress is always interested in health. The price of medicines is, is a, a perpetual concern on the Hill. We need to do a better job of relaying to Congress the role that patents and marketing exclusivities play. Congress is also concerned about innovation and greater awareness of health care. We need to do a better job of relaying the importance of patents in the development of drugs. Uh, taxation is a great example. Uh, recently, with the rise of tax patents, hordes of tax attorneys descended upon the Hill. Uh, they made patent issues aware to committees that normally don't have, handle patent matters uh, because it's not within their core jurisdiction. Uh, so that's something uh, also to be aware of. We need to, again, tie patents to, to more mainstream issues. I think we also need to tie patents more to regulation. Um, most of the Republicans on the Hill cut their teeth during the Reagan era. And so they're very opposed to regulation. They don't like government interference in privately operating markets. That's something they've been grown up to not like. We haven't done a good job of saying, well, that's really what patents are. Okay, patents are regulations granted by the government. There is a cost. So one person's incentive is another person's limitation. We need the patent system. It plays a valuable role in innovation. We have to have it. We don't have a better alternative of promoting innovation at this kind of price than the patent system. But at the same time, again, one person's incentive is another person's limitation. We need to start thinking about the regulatory impact of patents. Uh, the number of issued patents that comes out every year, if you put them all in a row, would be more pages than the Federal Register. So it's an enormous quantity of regulation, and we need to think about that before the relevant committees. How about the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office Rulemaking Authority? Uh, we've got a very bold USPTO management. It seems to have come a long way from the days of the Gore Initiative, where uh, the USPTO described patent applicants as customers. In fact, it still does. You'll still get that reference in literature. These are our customers, uh, and there aren't any other customers or clients of the patent office, just people getting patents. Uh, now we have a management that's been very aggressive and, and championing reforms that really no one in the patent bar seems to like. Even firms and individuals that have been very active in pr promoting patent reform have come to the patent office and, and come to court and have protested them. Um, they've been put on ice uh, in Taffas v. Dudas. We'll see what happens. Uh, I share the concerns of many about the retroactive effect of the rules. Uh, I believe that the, the, the judicial opinion is incorrect with respect to the, the forward-looking aspect of the rules. So again, I'll leave that to the next uh, uh, panel. Uh, I think USPTO rulemaking is something we should more seriously consider. Uh, the USPTO is it's a political entity. It's one we can control through our votes and through our lobby. We may not like this rulemaking uh, session, but rules can be changed. Uh, to me, the USPTO represents another point of traction uh, where innovation policy can be made. Uh, so congressional hearings have been very sympathetic. Uh, Congress, many members of Congress wonder, well, gosh, we've got nanotechnology coming along. We've got all these new technologies. How in Congress can we be expected to micromanage the PTO as it deals 
uh, with new technologies and new challenges to its administration. Uh, so I think that the USPTO rulemaking authorities on a substantive basis uh, is something we ought to seriously consider. Well, it's a little tricky to talk about it, uh, but I think that, that what we've seen in the patent reform era is a very pronounced anti-academic tenor. Uh, I think remarks of federal, certain Federal Circuit judges, former AIPLA presidents, uh, have been uh, not especially charitable uh, toward academic writing. Uh, the recent speech of Chief Judge Michelle goes down a list. If you haven't read it, I encourage you to do so. It goes down our list of uh, academic writers. Doesn't find much favor in any of the pieces. Um, the appointment of Judge Kimberly Moore recently to the bench we saw a lot of more observations like that. Now some of this can be attributed to the strident rhetoric that accompanies legislative debate. Uh, someone who lives in Washington, I know how that works. Everyone, sort of like a bar fight at the end, once, something, once the fight's over, everyone sort of kisses and makes up. This is the way it is. Um, but still, we've seen broader um, changes. For example, uh, the AIPLA, uh, used to have receptions for law schools, right? You used to have these beloved receptions. You'd go see all your classmates at Duke. I'm sure what other institutions would hold them. Well, those are gone. You don't see those on the agenda anymore. And that's because the IAPLA has kicked out the law schools. Uh, the ABA antitrust section. I've gone to a few of their annual meetings. It's great. There's a scholar's showcase. Artie, can you believe that? The antitrust section has a scholar's showcase for the ABA. You're not going to find a comparable scholar showcase uh, at any kind of uh, patent law meeting, ABA or otherwise. It's just not part of the community. Uh, patent academics are largely viewed as unwelcome, underqualified, uh, irrelevant actors uh, who just who speak things that are against the interest of the patent bar. Again, I think that's very unfortunate. I think it's unfortunate that a bar that is most tied up with innovation, that most promotes change that is most concerned with university research remains extremely hidebound, remains resistant to change, and remains indifferent to the products of the universities uh, in their own work products. So I think that's something we need to change. I don't have a great identity way of doing that other than to encourage academics to write scholarship uh, that is of a high quality. I, I think we can write scholarship that is better I think we can write scholarship that has doctrinal implications once in a while. I think we can do a better job of engaging the bar. I think we need to do a better job of pursuing positions in our professional communities uh, in terms of the ABA, ARA, PLA. Um, and I think we also need to avoid the rhetoric that is so often directed toward us. So I, th I would encourage uh, each of you uh, uh, to think about that. Uh, certainly when you're writing briefs, when you're making arguments, what is the role of scholarship and whether there's anything out there that could help you. I also think we ought to encourage the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission has an amazing track record on the Hill. Um, obviously, their Promote Innovation Report is a, considered at least the intellectual forebear. I've got my own suspicions, uh, but it is a moment. It is something that Congress has relied upon during uh, the legislative exercise. Uh, also, its report on, authorized, uh, excuse me, on generic competition inspired major changes in 2003 with the Medicare Modernization Act. So the FTC reports are, 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 are potent. Now they've got a much less successful track record in the courts, although I understand they're, they're going at it again with a reverse payment settlement case uh, filed, uh, filed last week. You know, we'll see what happens with all of that. Uh, but they've done a great job of expanding their patent expertise. They've got Suzanne Michelle at the head and a number of other patent lawyers. Uh, we're waiting for to see their authorized generics report. Uh, that's something that also seems to be taking a long time coming. Uh, but it's going to be, I think the FTC has the expertise. I think they can, they can uh, continue uh, to be a valued voice. They simply have resources, capabilities, and a history that a court does not have and that bar associations don't have. And I think it would going to be a welcome voice. Uh, finally, uh, as members of the professorate, uh, and I'll speak primarily to my colleagues here, I think we need to do a better job of managing university technology managers. Uh, universities have not been passive players. We haven't just been scholars commenting on different parts of the patent system that might need a little bit of tuning up. We've been active participants, but we haven't been talking. It's been our technology managers who have been doing the talking, and they've made major changes to the bill. 
uh, the, the, the grace period. Why do we have a very elaborate grace period in our so-called first to file system that's going to supposedly come with the legislation? It's because of Wharf, quite frankly. Uh, they've also t now tended to distance themselves from the bill. My suggestion is that if you talk to the average science and law faculty member, they would have very different <laughs> views from the views of the university technology managers. We've been asleep at the wheel. We've let others do the talking for us. And, and that's a mistake. I, I think we, we need to do a better job of, of, of talking to our presidents, to our deans, uh, about what our values are. Uh, universities uh, also represent sharing, volunteerism, uh, not necessarily the, the extreme view of proprietary rights that are projected upon us uh, by our representatives and really ultimately our employees. Uh, so again, I think we need to do a much better job uh, of that in the future. Okay, this is my last slide. I told you I wouldn't go for an hour, and I'm, I'm not sure I'm gonna, not going to be heckled out of the room, but I haven't had a banana nut muffin uh, come my way yet. Um, <laughs> so we'll see. Um, I think what we need to do after these bills pass, or, or, if, they're not, or if they're thwarted uh, with the patent reform bill, I think we need to be mindful of future areas of congressional interest. 2008 is shaping up to be the year of the design patent, believe it or not. This humble intellectual property right may be expanded or retracted with respect to fashion, with respect to car parts. Uh, there's uh, legislation and judicial developments. Uh, Congress is, is going to have a chance to think about how the patent system works with respect to designs. Uh, and this uh, will also engage committees that don't usually interact with the patent system. Uh, so that's something to think about. I think a bigger area is file, follow on biologics. Uh, as you know, for small molecule chemicals, generic drug companies can file, fo file follow on applications, generic, they're called generic, um, that allows them to rely upon the research data generated by brand name firms. Uh, but because of uh, less ability to characterize biologics, uh, drugs that have much larger molecules that are much more complex, uh, the existing Hatch-Waxman framework uh, is considered to be inadequate. Congress is thinking about a follow-on biologics regime, and there's talk of a 12, 14, even a 16-year marketing exclusivity for brand-name follow-on biologics. And what's interesting to me about the debate is when uh, brand name drug companies come to Congress to say, well, what's their effective patent term after extension? They're like, oh, it's nine, 10 years. But when they come to talk about marketing exclusives or biologic, oh, the effective term is really 12, 14 years, and we should have a guarantee, <laughs> we should have a guarantee. which is it? But um, I don't know. But I, I think Congress, this is something Congress is going to think about. There's a lot of talk on the street that this is not something that's going to happen, this Congress. But again, I think with the election coming up, I think brand name firms may be rethinking that. They may be thinking this is their best opportunity to get a bill they can live with prior to the inauguration of the new regime. Uh, so we'll see. Again, this will also give an opportunity for pat the Congress to talk about the patent system, even if the patent reform bill uh, falters or indeed if it is enacted. Again, I think the ultimate goal uh, of anyone who's concerned about the patent system, and no matter what your views, they may differ dramatically from mine, uh, but I think uh, we need to develop additional points of traction. We need to develop additional con uh, con con conversationalists. We need to develop different people who are entities who care about patent policy. And I hope their voices will be heard in the future. And I also hope that this reform era will not pr prove an isolated spot, uh, but prove to be something that persists. Okay, well look, again, I try to be a little provocative. I tried to wake you up in case that the delight delightful Duke University coffee uh, didn't do the trick. Again, it's my great pleasure to come to Duke, and I'd be delighted to take any questions or simply listen to your observations. Thank you for hearing me out. Um, first of all, didn't these guys on the federal circuit, didn't they go to law school? I was just wondering why they don't want to listen to law professors. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, my first question is, uh, that wasn't a question. The, um, um, I was, if, 
how effective, I'm very interested in how to better inform the federal circuit about competition policy issues as they make this intellectual <coughs> property decisions. How effective are things like amicus briefs by third parties to help educate the federal circuit about the competition aspect of some of these rules? Okay, well, maybe it's because they've gone to law school, they've had enough of, of law professors, and the, 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 the three years was enough. It, it remains a paradox for me because Federal Circuit judges are beloved instructors at local law schools. Uh, they serve on boards of directors of the law schools. Uh, they are casebook co-authors. They seem very engaged in almost any measurable trait in academia except for the citations. And I think part of it is because the mission of the court was to harmonize patent law. So they're very concerned about looking at each other's opinions and uh, it, it, there, there's less room for outside argument. I, I, I think it's just a very insular body, and that's, that, it, that's by design. Uh, so I think that, that, that legacy has maintained itself. Uh, we did have a member of the professor on the bench, Judge Plager, and now we have another one. So we'll see if, uh, if, if times change. I don't know how effective amicus briefs have been. Uh, I've filed several amicus briefs before the court, and my side's lost every time. So I think they've been very ineffective. That was supposed to be humorous. But anyway, um, <laughs> obviously it's difficult for, member, for members of the academy to become walking, talking amicus writers. Uh, you know, it's very difficult to, to, to start discover when the case is coming up. Uh, it's difficult to try to inject a, a brief in at that time. Briefs cost money to write, and so that's something, if I can't get it out of my research budget, I'm probably not going to do it, even for the modest printing costs. Um, and I don't think deans value amicus briefs that much, so it's not going to help me when I fill out my annual salary memo. I filed an amicus brief at the Federal Circuit. Uh, much better to have a placement in a high-ranking law journal. So for those reasons, it's tough. I, sh I should hope that, that the Federal Circuit would be interested, but I, th I think, um, you know, I think that remains to be seen. Follow-up. What about the I think there's more, more evidence that the Supreme Court has paid attention because they tend to cite more articles that are, that are discussed in those briefs. Uh, yes, the Me? Yeah. Oh. Is that flowers? Well, no, it's Doss, but that's okay. I don't know if there's flowers behind me. Um, a lot of your, it was really good talk, by the way, and a lot of your discussion about reform, you said that it seemed to be all internal to the United States, just various pressures and reasons. Um, outside of the U.S., the, the, our patent system is not really that highly regarded. And I was just wondering if you thought that there were any pressures that, if anyone inside the U.S. cares what's happening with the other patent systems, and if there's any of that pressure that caused this reform. I don't believe so. I don't think there's that, there's that much pressure felt inside the Beltway uh, from outside the United States. Uh, it may be that... Uh, the U.S. Patent Office is a laughing stock in some foreign quarters, uh, but I don't think that matters too much to Congress. I, have, I haven't observed that. In fact, I've seen just the opposite. Um, there was testimony recently about the Process Patent Amendments Act before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and of course a lot of those bills had their origin from foreign law. We simply adopted provisions we found, especially from the German law, uh, but it, a couple of people brought it up or really, immediately slammed. Uh, you know, it's like, oh, you want us to enact foreign law? It's like, well, we already did in, in 1988. So I, I don't see that. I don't see that as an input, but it, that's an interesting suggestion. I hadn't thought about that. The first file system, it's basically to get to harmony with the other patent systems, right? That's true, but I think that's because domestic industry wants it. Okay. Like, I, don't think, I don't think there's much sense like we ought to do things the, the way the Europeans do. I don't do. get that sense either. I just know you have different yeah. insight. And no, I, sh I, share your, I share your sense that that's not a, a major factor right now. Uh, yes. Um, my recollection is that uh, one of the goals of the creation of the Federal Circuit was to end forum shopping. Uh, how effective do you think the Federal Circuit was at ending foreign forum shopping? Well, judging by the venue, is everyone, should I repeat the questions? Uh, okay, so how, how effective was the Federal Circuit in preventing forum shopping? Well, obviously, with venue uh, pr uh, reform on the rise, and we have uh, what would plainly be the most complicated venue statute in the history of the Republic uh, with respect to patents, we're on the verge of enacting, where basically your venue is decided by who you are in a very elaborate way. 
uh, a classic example of just lobbying. Obviously, it hasn't been that successful uh, because there's a great deal of concern that various districts or so-called magnet jurisdictions have been, have been attracting, um, uh, attracting litigants. Uh, obviously, at the, the court of second instance, we don't have form shopping anymore by necessity, but I, I think most people would still rather go with a successful verdict on appeal. They'd rather have it in hand than not. And so uh, surely there has been uh, a form shopping at the district court level. Uh, yes, Jake, one, if, if I understood your talk correctly, it sounds like one of the tectonic movements here is that um, one way of saying it would be that patent law matters enough that the core constituencies that used to contain it as their own thing, like the CAFC in the one hand and the AIPLA on the other, um, they are now kind of used to the current rules, but other groups are dissatisfied with the status quo and are beginning to push for change, and maybe that's why they're reaching over their head and the Supreme Court's reaching down and saying, yeah, you're right. Um, so one of the things that suggests is that this dialogue, or it's not a dialogue, it's a multi-party, yeah, right. there are a lot of places yeah, right. that, that care about this now. Um, and it sounded like you wanted something in the legislative branch that would allow that, and you also talked about FTC. <laughs> um, and you also talked about the analytic capacity at the USPTO. So there are a lot of balls in the air here. Um, but if I understand it, the part of the Patent Reform Act that got removed rather readily was creating some analytic capacity for the USPTO, even though what you said is the hearings, they sounded like they were members of Congress were happy with that, but it doesn't sound like the interest groups are, and, and certainly my limited engagement with patent reform, the point of consensus is those people at USPTO are so profoundly incompetent we can't possibly trust them with thinking about policy. Um, so could tell us how you're thinking about, from, from your years of experience, how do we make that dialogue productive um, after, the, after the election, one way or the other on reform? But what's interesting for a lot, that, that, that's, those are some great observations and uh, you know, that's quite a challenging uh, suggestion at the end to, to speak. One thing I observed that a lot, during much of the legislative reform process, the USPTO effectively enjoyed laughing stock status. Um, that's because of patent quality issues. Now, you could especially see that in the language of the appropriators. The various appropriations committees were just savaging the patent office saying they had, they, they've wasted all this money on this information system and, and their patent quality is bad. But we, all, we have to take those comments with a grain of salt because on the Hill there's, there are three parties. There's the Democrats, the Republicans, and the appropriators. And they're always going to want to fund money to their own pet projects. So of course they're going to savage the patent office as an excuse for not giving them more money. Um, so, but I think that was, so the patent office actually, I think has upped its game recently. They've been a little more better at lobbying and they've been working more closely with the Department of Commerce. So we started seeing the Department of Commerce coming in um, because the Patent Office sort of went up to try to get some help uh, on the Hill. In terms of getting more analytical capability and, and rulemaking ability, I, I would agree that's a very tough challenge. I think a lot of parties are concerned that the Patent Office could say, well, here's a rule on the obviousness standard. After KSR, you know, they put out a little Federal Register uh, discussion on KSR, suppose that becomes the rule of law the courts have to apply, uh, that becomes worrisome to many parties. Um, so in terms of trying to, to, to talk it up, um, I think ultimately Congress will have to be more impressed with the difficulty of the challenge that the Patent Office faces, uh, the, the ch technological change that Congress is ill-suited to deal with on a, on a daily basis. Um, and to suggest, look, the Patent Office is one of the oldest administrative agencies in this country. It's probably the oldest. Uh, and yet it doesn't have rulemaking authority that is enjoyed by its peers. So I think those are some platform points. But I, I share your sense that this, is, this would be a challenge. And we don't, we're going to have to bring more constituents in to have anything happen. I hope that was at least somewhat responsive. Here's your face. Artie, do you have any sense of? Uh... Yeah, no, I, I share Jay's skepticism. Um, I, I rarely, I teach administrative law. I've rarely seen as much antipathy towards an administrative agency by a bar than I've seen by the patent bar. It's a, it's a profound level of disrespect that one doesn't see with the EPA or the FCC, even the FCC, which is not well respected necessarily. Um, and I think 
think part of the problem may be that it, it is one of our oldest administrative agencies, so it predated the rise of the modern administrative state, and no one thought about updating it to reflect the modern administrative state, um, which I think is unfortunate. And so we need some profound change at the PTO in order for it to reflect the modern administrative state, and it's not there yet. Um, but uh, I, I don't see how we can get away with that ultimately if we're going to have sound innovation policy. Uh, yeah. um, hearing this, I just I feel compelled to, to jump in just on the question of the PTO. I, I think you're accurate in saying that there is a unique level of contempt <coughs> by the bar for the Patent Office Administration, but I want to just push back a bit on, on the theory that that's always been there. The reason there's this contempt is that, you know, the last few years of their thought process and how to re-engineer their procedures has been so stupid that <laughs> the entire patent bar has called them to task on it. And, you know, I was there for a decade. We ran three or four major reform exercises. I read 500 and some, you know, comments from the public on changing software patent standards. And we thought we did a pretty good job responding and adjusting and developing and, you know, taking input and changing the initial thoughts we had to come up with better practices. What you see in this round is 550 people representing essentially a uniform view across all industries, across all sizes of, of respondents, telling them this is the dumbest roll package I've seen in my life, and the PTO plows ahead and, and enacts it. And you know, it's not a, this isn't a unique issue to the PTO. This is any any administrative agency that is as suicidal to ignore their constituent bodies, you know, in that is speaking in a uniform way, is going to lose respect. And and that's the fundamental problem with the dynamic right now. That rule package and their approach in the past few years of rule packages has really eroded the confidence of people to see the PTO showing kind of creativity and thoughtfulness and insight and balance in designing a reform package that's going to make the system work better. That's the fundamental problem that, that we have with the dynamic with the PCR right now. Um, I speak probably more candidly than most because I was a consumer of the public opinion for seven or eight years and we, you know, we were very sensitive, you know, maybe more sensitive than they are now. I think there are a lot of different things that can be done to make the patent office run its business much better than it does now. I keep laughing at him saying, implement, you know, on-demand examination, you can shave 7% of your workload off like that. If you want to play numbers, you know, you can do lots of things to change your, your, your workload. But, the, but that's been the fundamental problem. They have taken a path which has really failed to let the bar and the other interest groups come in and shape the reform process inside the PTO in the manner that they had been done, that historically has been done, you know, before this exercise. So I'll just throw that out. Not, and you'll be happy to know I'm not defending the Patent Office, I'm attacking them like everybody else, but it's just the, there's a different <coughs> footing from my perspective. Are you going to follow up on that or may I jump in? No. Uh, my vote. Oh. Okay. Okay. That, and, and Jeff, I, I've got a great respect for you and, and your views on this, but I, I, I think you, you somewhat mischaracterize what the USPTO has done. And it's been a multi-year process. The rules that were enacted were different than the ones that were originally proposed because of changes. Uh, but I, I, I certainly agree with you that the, the, the relevant, as you say, the relevant constituencies, in other words, people who get patents, are, are used to the patent office basically being their private sandbox and that they're used to being able to play around in there and influence what's done. And I don't, I, I'm, I'm not sure that there, there's been this lack of listening. I think there's been more of that than, than some comments suggest. Um, uh, but I, I do tend to agree this could have been handled politically better. Um, so, I mean, there's fair enough. Aspects of, I mean, it strikes me, and I called it an e-history when we talked about the PTO um, in the Tapas case. So, you know, I don't have my priors, but um, the retroactivity yeah, I agree with that, certainly. Yeah, I mean. Well, I mean, uh, we don't want to hijack this yeah. uh, discussion, but I think one thing that the PTO has done is they've done a very numeric perspective on reducing, you know, their workload and, and balancing their resources to work less. And that shows a very shallow thinking, in my perspective, of 
you know, how do we make the numbers look better as opposed to change the processes that let us do our job better. And that's that's a big criticism that came through in a lot of these remarks that was completely ignored. I don't think it's a sandbox issue. I think, you know, I don't think you should disregard good advice from people who try to communicate in a balanced way about what they're doing in front of the agency. And, you know, I think that's that's a big problem. They didn't listen to the kind of conceptual redesign messages that came in, which weren't all focused about just, you know, keeping things the same. Um, and that's the thing that I think has really lost a lot of the trust that, that, that used to be there. Well, we'll have plenty more time to talk about that very controversial set of questions in, um, in our next panel. And, uh, and Jay will join us then um, for the moderated discussion um, after the presentation. So Jennifer uh, Jara Coltart, who is my boss in all of this, who's, who's um, running the Department Symposium, suggested we should call this to a conclusion. Um, perhaps we could have a question from Professor Reichman and then take a break. Oh, well, uh, I was curious to hear, you know, this notion that, well, we had this, the oldest agency and it's set in its ways and uh, that's too bad. But, you know, we, we, we're always advising the developing countries, well, you should have some uh, high policy supervision of innovation policy. And it's always the same. Uh, they're over there in WIPO saying everything is terrible and, they're, and their uh, patent office are, are doing exactly what our patent offices do. And, and, and just muddle through on a perfectly high protectionist bend as if they were in another world. So I wonder if it isn't time uh, to establish an interagency innovation group. Uh, it seems to me that that's where, if you want to get anything done, you uh, if you had a, another an administration that actually believes in government, <laughs> then you could <laughs> have an interagency uh, a monitoring group which would uh, advise and supervise the patent office and not leave it by default to an agency that has a totally different uh, agenda and can't really deal with innovation policy. I have an article on that. Yeah. Is that right? <laughs> All right. How we need an interagency uh, group. Yeah. <laughs> so, at least one academic. Um, so thank you, Professor Thomas. Thank you very much. Wonderfully stimulating and provocative speech, and we will have you once again on our panel after the presenters um, uh, present their uh, uh, talks. <coughs> and we will reconvene at 10.15 sharp for our next panel on patent reform and some of these hot button issues. So, continue. Thanks a lot, Artie. I appreciate sure. it. No, thanks a lot. <laughs>